Are you troubled by strange noises? The amount of six foot black silhouette of a cowboy with a cowboy hat. He had a death draw. You said you said there's lights in the sky. Yeah, there's, there's a four lot. It's moving real slow. Real slow. It's showtime. <laughs> The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, horror, fantasy, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hi, welcome to the Emmett Blackwell Show. This is Emmett Blackwell, and I am here with author Francis Sparks. He has written um, Made Safe, which is his debut book um, in January 17th, 2017. So this is a fairly recent book. And we're going to talk to him a little bit about his inspirations, how he got started in the biz, and um, generally what's going on in the future for him. So, Francis, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Emmett. How's it going? Pretty good. So. Good. My uh, listeners here, they just kind of want to know about who you are. And um, mm-hmm. one of those things is getting to know about how you got into writing. What was one of the first experiences you had with writing? Um, so this goes back quite a ways. Um, I liked reading when I was growing up, but I didn't really fall in love with reading until um, about fifth or sixth grade. Um, we had, you know, our, our town had a, a library and the bookmobile would come to our school like once a month or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they had this old TSR book. Um, it was like the first book in the Dragonlance series, the Chronicles. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, um, but anyway, I, I read that one and then I read all of, all of those, you know, everything in that there's like six or nine of those books. And then like everything put out by, um, TSR wizards of the coast, like forgotten realms and all that sort of stuff. And so then that, so my goal at that point, once I started, you know, loving all these fantasy books was like, okay, I want to turn this into my job. I want to work, you know, at TSR when I grow up. Um, oh, oh yeah. So that's when I really started thinking about it. Um, you know, go work for the company where Dungeons and Dragons was uh, um, created and all that sort of stuff. But um, so that sort of you know got pushed aside by high school, college, and that sort of sort of stuff. Um, but then um, I remember it really clearly. Um, you, you know, you always sort of hear you know you need to really you hear sometimes anyway that that uh, the people in the know say that you need to sort of have life experience to be able to write um, and you need to accumulate that and sort of that. Yeah, how, you how do you do that right with fantasy, you, you know? <laughs> yeah, with fantasy. Um, so, well, I think, you know, um, that's the thing. I think, it, I was just thinking about this earlier, actually. Fantasy is, is neat because you can sort of change a lot of the rules, but at the end of the day, what's going to draw readers into what you're writing is those characters and those sort of similarities that they see with a certain character or somebody that you're writing. Um, and sure it could be, you know, that that person might be writing a dragon or casting a magic spell or something, but at the, you know, they're still going to be that human element somewhere inside that, that a reader's going to connect with. Oh yeah. And now are you like many other authors who try to draw on people in your lives to, to build up your characterization? Um, yes, uh, I don't, you know, it's always sort of like, you know, um, uh, a strange thing somebody does here, like an odd feature of another person over there, sort of like all, all melded together into like one sort of character. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's always, you know, you know, th- there's bits and pieces of people in sort of every character and yourself, of course. So, um, I don't, yeah, I don't think I've ever, um, said, oh, this per- this is this person in real life, and they're in my story. I don't think that's that's ever happened. I think that only happens to people that uh, really um, anger. <laughs> oh yeah, and they yeah. don't. They'll probably <laughs> they'll probably don't last very long in the story. Yeah, we're like the name is Linda, but they call her Lindy or something. You know. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and that can happen. So now, are you sending in- a message? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are you involved in like any type of writing organizations or writing groups currently? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I'm involved with uh, my local chapter of Sisters in Crime, um, mm-hmm. and they call us misters. Um, <laughs> they meet once a month at a coffee shop, and they bring in authors and stuff like that. Um, I'm also involved with, um, I live in Iowa, um, and Des Moines, Iowa, and it's our writers group, is called. it's a critique group. It's mm-hmm. called uh, Des Moines Writers Workshop, um, oh, cool. and we meet once a month as well, and we do uh, 2,500-word critiques, so um, you're k- kind of... Um, under the gun to keep producing every month, which is a nice thing. Um, and you yeah. get a lot of 
good feedback from four or five other group members um, on something you're working on. Um, yeah, so I try to stay involved um, with local organizations, and I'm, I'm part of a few um, national organizations, like Sisters in Crime is national as well, and mm-hmm. um, there's the Nonfiction Writers Association. I just I just joined as well because I started um, a new uh, a new project that's actually nonfiction, which is something new for me. So, so what's that project all about? Yeah, so this was, um, it was it's almost been uh, eight nine months um, ago. Uh, I got contacted by a retired New Jersey detective um, who had already sort of um, um, he's got an incredible story. So he's he's got this history of this like one criminal that he met and when that criminal was like 18 years old and actually, you know, did a police interview of him. Um, and he knew in that meeting that this guy is going to be like this major criminal in the future. So he sort of remembered him, um, you know, worked his, uh, you know, his, his contacts in the area to, you know, his like girlfriend and stuff like that to make sure that he's keeping tabs on this guy. And so, you know, 10 years later, he, he arrests, he arrests this guy again. Um, the guy is this, he's this like master cat burglar who can like sneak into uh, any mansion it seems and, and get away with uh, get away with the goods inside. Um, but, but this guy, even in retirement um, kept chasing him. It was actually part of a, uh, a task force that uh, brought him down for the final time a few years ago. So anyway, he, he, um, ha- you know, just needed some help writing the story. And I told him, you know, right away, I'm a fiction writer. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, why did you reach out to me? And, and he, he just, had had some bad luck with other authors that weren't taking his, his story um, or, or putting the story in the direction he wanted them to go. So um, we hit it off and we've been working together for like nine months now. And um, yeah, it's been really great. And it, and you know, it's great. So uh, just a few days ago, I got a packet in the mail, which was, you know, some, um, some other sort of case document um, about this criminal um, wow. with uh, you know, a hand, a hand drawn escape map from a, from a jail and all sorts of <laughs> great information to dig through. And um, yeah, so um, it's been really fun. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I wasn't, I mean, I knew of narrative nonfiction, but um, I've been really trying to flex, you know, bring in um, my, my fiction muscles and to help, you know, sort of tell this as, as an engaging story versus just like this happened, you know, on this date and this happened on that date and this is what happened here. I'm trying to really sort of paint the the full picture of what's going on um, over this course of this like 30 year, uh, story. Wow, that's and that's another thing. Like, it, it seems to me, Francis, like you're like the the master of community involvement when it comes to your writing, and that's <laughs> that's great. You know, that's something that you don't see very often because most of the time you'll see a writer. The whole um, stereotype is that some writer sitting in in a closed area room with a typewriter and he doesn't talk to anybody and it's all in his own mind. And and you've really mm-hmm. gotten out into the community, and that's amazing. Well, so everybody, I think, that writes starts um, as that person in the closet, you know, banging away mm-hmm. on the typewriter or computer or whatever. But what really helped me um, was getting out there and starting to share some of my work. Um, and, and, you know, there was another group in, in Des Moines that I that you sort of like would go there and um, you didn't they didn't get your work ahead of time, but you would read it aloud yeah. um, and you would get like instant feedback. And, and that was sort of like the first time I started, you know, getting out there. And then I found um, the critique group, which like was like another level of like, okay, more in depth feedback. Here's what you're doing. Well, here's what you need to work on. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I, I think it's, it's really important to, yes, go and go and be creative by yourself. But then I think at some point you have to be like, okay, this is as good or as is good enough to show somebody else and then get some honest feedback on what's working, what's not working to make it, to make it better, whether that's like beta readers or, or just somebody you trust. But um, I think that's been a really important step for me. Yeah. And, and that's another thing, especially if you're an author and you're just getting started, a lot of the authors who just get started uh, use proof editors and copy editors and, and they're finding these people and it's good that they find them. Okay. But mm-hmm. to have a team of people and, and in most cases, obviously you guys are friends, on, on a certain level, to have that group of people around you to say, hey, can I bounce these ideas off of you? Can I um, have you just okay. look at my grammar? You know, I mean, that's mm-hmm. amazing that you have that ability. And now, when it comes to joining those groups, I mean, would you suggest that every author goes out and tries to do this? Um, I mean, yeah. So, well, okay, so here's another thing that that's also very important, especially if you're going to um, – 
I think everybody's got this goal to get, you know, have the best possible work out there. But you're, once your work's out there, it's out mm-hmm. there, and you're going to start getting feedback whether you want it or not if you're, yeah. you're going to sell your work, right, if you're going to put it out there. So the important step for me was, you know, when somebody sits there and says something about something you worked on for a certain amount of time, um, and it's the first time you've had that experience, it's, it's you know, regardless if it's <clears> – <throat> 99.9% positive feedback, you'll, you're going to hear that 0.1% feedback the loudest, and it's going to be something that you're going to need to to deal with however you're going to deal with it. And the more you do it, the more you have that sort of like, okay, I can take this criticism, I can look at it um, objectively and not sort of get, you know, into, um, into sort of like a more emotional sort of state. So starting out with like reading in front of somebody and then going into this group and getting feedback in person, um, is this, uh, you know, like, um, I submitted short stories. I, I submit short stories a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to get, you're going to, if you do that, you're going to get, you know, all sorts of rejection until it finds its right place. Right. Yeah. So, and that can, and that can hurt unless you, you know, unless you can put it in sort of a context and say, well, you know, this isn't for everybody and that's sort of okay. Yeah, and, and that's another thing, too, is by bringing the authors here on the show, we're starting to realize, and anybody who's listening, too, is kind of getting the idea that, that collaboration is not a bad thing. It's very helpful not to everybody who's out there. And so, um, like even like you said, once you put those short stories out there, you're going to get those comments. And, and we're even thinking about bringing on some authors from the Wattpad app. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and sure. so it, it's yep. a good place to bounce ideas off of people, especially when you're far away from them. Mm-hmm. Um, now, yep. as far as your stuff, the, the Made Safe book, this was your debut book, um, and it mm-hmm. came out in... Uh, January 17th of 2017, and this was not mm-hmm. just your debut writing. This was your debut single authorship of a, of a novel. Um, what's the Correct. premise of Made Safe? Sure. Um, so, yeah, the premise of Made Safe um, is always the fun part of um, trying to consolidate something that's sort of long into sort of a few sentences. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess at, at the end of it, um, Made Safe... Uh, the general premise is made safe is uh, about a private investigator who um, who's on this case for this wife, you know, her husband's cheating on her. So uh, he gets, they, they end up at this cabin out in the middle of, uh, out of, you know, some miles away from town in Iowa in the, in the dead of winter. Mm-hmm. Um, and this sort of altercation happens. The husband gets hurt, gets put in the hospital. And so within 24 hours, the husband is actually calling this private investigator, Moses Winter. And yeah. he's like, you got to come meet me because, you know, I, I'm in trouble. You need to come meet me. So Moses finds his car where they're supposed to meet and, the, and finds his trail leading up into the snow, into the woods. Um, and then Moses follows it, gets, he himself gets attacked. Um, and then they find, you know, he, the, the police show up. They can't find Fred. He's disappeared. This, mm-hmm. uh, this husband, Fred, Dun- Fred Dunsmore. And so this, this is the beginning for Moses of this sort of like unraveling of like these people's lives and what's, what's um what's sort of hidden behind you know the walls of their ho- of their homes um and the and the cool thing is he when he when those when the police show up it's the se- second sort of main character in the in the novel whose name is Rafe Rakick oh, who yeah. is this um he's this Bosnian um um immigrant who's uh you know a state police detective and uh he's he's uh he's a character that started out like he was like a sentence or two, you know, he had a few sentences here or there. And like, by the time I was done with the book, he was, he was almost alternating chapters. His voice just kept growing and I, and I love the character so much, but, um, but yeah. So anyway, these two end up, you know, working this case together. And, um, I guess I'll just sort of leave it there. Winter in Iowa is definitely a major, major, um, part of it. Um, and yeah, it's not, it doesn't have any fantasy or sort of supernatural elements to it. Yeah. But as a, as a lifelong fan of that, um, there are some, there's some different things in the book that I sort of, I, I think sort of like evoke that sort of mood. Um, especially when, you know, you're, you're walking out into the middle of the forest and the dead of winter, um, with, you know, by yourself. Um, yeah. and then all sort of these strange, strange noises start happening and you get attacked. It sort of can feel like, um, maybe you're in a horror movie. Yeah, some of the most scariest things that could happen uh, may just happen in your own mind. And anything <laughs> right. that gets the heart racing, okay, <laughs> anything that invokes that Absolutely. kind of chill, um, it, it, it kind of falls into what we always look for here on the Emmett Blackwell Show. So, and another yeah. thing, too, now, 
the Maid Safe, that's on Amazon.com right now, correct? Correct. You can get it on Amazon, um, you know, sort of like all the major online places. Um, yeah, it's available right now. All right. Well, I'm going to put that in the description of the YouTube video as well so people can actually experience that and get it. Um, and the other book that you have, this is kind of goes back to, you know, uh, doing your short story work. Um, this mm-hmm. one, which I think is the longest title I've seen in a while, but it, it sounds <laughs> very creepy and I like it. Let me read this to you. The Great sure. Tome of Darkest Horrors on Unspeakable Evils. <laughs> okay, what is yeah. this project all about? Yeah, so um, this is this is put out by Bards and Sages um, Publishers. Um, mm-hmm. They do um, they do a couple uh, publications um, where you you know where they publish short stories. But then they they came out with these anthologies starting a few years ago, and they started um, I think ones all to do with like sort of um, with magic. This one's about horror, and I think there's like they've, they're you know the numbers of these films are keep growing. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, this one was all about you know sort of like the worst sort of horror it's sort of a very specific horror genre sort of story um and i had submitted to them um for their main publication and they were like you know um this actually fits better and this other thing that we have coming out would you do this and they sent me the title and you just read it and i was like of course i'm of course i'm gonna do that <laughs> with, a, with a name with a name like that that sounds amazing yes i will do that all so, right yeah um and the story story's called 20 steps um and it's um it's sort of um it, it's it's about, uh, again, it's, it's, you know, I sort of like these, um, um, desolate rural settings. Um, mm-hmm. this one's not in set in winter by any means, but, um, it's, it's sort of more like autumn and this girl sees something on this road she's walking down and she is all of a sudden, um, being pursued by this like unknown shadow. I call him the shadow, um, yeah. or it's the shadow in the story. Um, but yeah. All right, and we're going to listen to an excerpt of that right now, um, if you'll join us. Twenty steps. The solitary figure stood in the gathering shadows facing her, eyes invisible below a dark hood. Marie imagined the eyes were staring at her. She imagined they were a man's eyes. She wasn't sure what had alerted her to his presence. Maybe it was a bird crying out, or the crunch of a leaf, or snapping of a twig underfoot, or something else. But now the only thing was the shadow, standing, staring, and waiting. The wind caught the shadow's large cloak, billowing it out behind him in rippling waves of leather, revealing a tall, slim figure beneath. The shadow was clothed from head to foot in charcoal and black, save for the crimson vest. The sun offered little help in identifying the interloper, stuck as it was, behind ash-colored clouds in the last hours of the day, appearing only as a pale disk in the sky. Then the cloak snapped back to the shadow's body, the wind suddenly dead, and he was all black again, leaving only a blaze of red on his chest. Then the shadow started walking toward her, walking toward her in long, deliberate strides, splitting the cloak with black boots. He advanced on her. She fumbled in her coat pocket for the handle of her skinning knife, still secured by leather straps to a tough rawhide sheath. Realizing it was too late to free the knife, she whirled away, grabbed her yellow skirt, and in one hand she propelled herself down the trail, deeper into the forest. She counted twenty steps before she chanced to look over her shoulder. She stopped, crying out in astonishment. The shadow had vanished from the trail. She leaned against a small tree, her breath coming in harsh gasps. He was gone. She hadn't dreamed it. He had been there. But now he wasn't. The trail wasn't safe anymore. She needed to leave it. She pushed on, searching for a favorable gap in the undergrowth to exit the trail. Twenty steps more. Something strange caught her eye, dangling from a tree in the distance, a large bell-shaped silhouette swinging like a pendulum. She felt her steps match the motion of the object. Back, forth. One, two. Back, forth. One, two. Back, forth. One. She froze. She yanked the blade from her pocket and tore at the straps until it was free. She glanced back again. No one followed. Marie felt her ribs frozen in her chest, threatening to rob her of her breath. The shadow was gone. 
but he was somewhere behind her. She could feel him back there, and the thing ahead of her was a warning. Marie had no choice but to continue. A shiver started at the wrist of her hand holding the knife and continued up her arm to her shoulder and neck, terminating in her jaw. She shook her head and advanced, her legs numb and clumsy with fear. Closer now, she knew exactly what it was. It was a woman, strung up by her shoeless legs to the broad bow of a leafless maple tree, her face and torso obscured by the long cream underskirt, her arms dangling from the center. Her bruised hands curled in on themselves. Suddenly, the temperature plummeted, and a great gust caught the hanging woman spinning her. The woman's skirt fanned out in a wide circle, rising above her shoulders so fast Marie glimpsed only a bare impression of her features through the several revolutions of her body. Then the rope creaked in protest, suspending her in a moment, revealing her face frozen in anguish. Then her skirts fell, shrouding her face again as it began slowly to spin in the opposite direction. Raw realization hit Marie in a flood of nausea. She knew this woman. Marie's throat tightened as she forced down the bitterness welling up in her stomach. The shadow forgotten, she turned to flee in the opposite direction only to find him blocking her way again. He was closer now, not moving, only watching. She cursed God and abandoned the trail. She scrambled into the dry underbrush, fighting through thick branches and thorny bushes that threatened to drag her to the ground. Finally, she broke into a dry creek bed, filled with fallen leaves running parallel to the trail. She could go right, back the way she had come, or left, her original direction. She caught her breath and lurched to the left. The creek bed was easy to follow, and her pace increased. The leaves the only sound as they spread across her ankles. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Twenty steps. She turned and checked behind her. Nothing. Marie continued on. The banks of the creek bed rose steadily above her until now they were over her head. She passed on. 20 steps. Clear now, no sign of the shadow. The air chilled and she glanced to the sky. Jagged crimson fingers of light spread through the gray valleys of the clouds as they were marked by the sun's final descent. Marie's foot caught on a hole in the ground, pitching her forward to one knee. She checked behind her as she shoved herself back to her feet. Turning back to the trail, she fought the scream surging up her throat as she again found herself face to face with the shadow. I'm going! You can't stop me! she said, struggling to contain the panic creeping in her voice. The shadow stood motionless before her. She strained to look into his eyes in the waning light, searching for some sign of humanity. Why was he chasing me? It didn't matter. Either way, she wasn't going along that easily. She turned and ran. She ran until her heart pounded and her lungs ached. And she ran some more. She ran until her legs were dead and the weightless brown leaves of the creek bed felt heavy against her feet. She ran until finally she faltered and fell. She lay for a moment, face down the leaves, expecting the shadow to begin his assault on her at any moment. When he didn't come, she looked up. The path was clear. She got herself to her feet and pressed onward. By now, she was past the point where she had originally entered the bed. Again, the banks rose up around her until she was in a tunnel, the roof, the rapidly approaching night sky. Then she saw the red blaze at eye level. The shadows seemed to materialize around it, darker than the night. He wasn't there, and then he was. Or maybe he had always been there. You can't stop me, she cried. To hell with this. No more running. I will leave this world fighting. Knife bared. She sprang at him. She fell upon him with primal abandon, plunging the blade repeatedly into the red target on his chest. One, two, three times. She felt the knife hit home. The adrenaline coursed through her, mixing with her fear and the violence of the act into an intoxicating surge of savage energy. The blade pumped again and again. Somewhere deep in her mind, she let herself believe she would survive. Then she felt the shadow envelop her. His arms encircling her arms. She thrashed against them, slashing with the knife. But his arms kept pressing in on her. She pushed him in the chest, but it was like pushing on an old oak tree. She struggled more, and the arms grew tighter with her every movement until her arms were forced to her sides. She was mired, mired in the shadow. He has me now, 
she thought, as she felt the bones of her arms being slowly pressed into her ribs, robbing her of breath. She had lost. She screamed in rage until she struggled to breathe. She had lost. It was all over. Now, he would crush the life out of her. Then she realized the shadow wasn't crushing her. He held her tightly, but he no longer seemed intent on smothering her. She managed to look into his face, but his features escaped her in the gloom of nightfall. The shadow released her from his embrace and captured her wrist in his hand. She felt the cold power in him as her arm grew numb and the grip on the knife weakened until she could no longer hold on to it and it fell to the ground. Then she began dragging her back the way they had come. No, she screamed. Where are you taking me? Why are you doing this? The shadow offered no response except to pull her forward. I can't. I can't die. I'm too young. But no response came. Then they were on the trail again. The woman, hanging from the tree, had stopped moving now. She dangled limp and dead in the twilight. She was a year younger than Marie. Marie fell to her knees, struggling against the iron strength of the shadow. She succeeded in bringing them to a stop. She pounded her free fist into the packed earth. I've still got so much to do, don't you understand? She sobbed the last word as tears of despair flowed onto the dirt below her. What had she left to do that the world would miss? She didn't know. Why don't you leave me alone? I need more time. The shadow lowered his head toward her, seeming to contemplate her words for a moment. Marie's mind raced for something to bargain with. What do you want? Money? I will work the rest of my life to fill your pockets. Just let me go. I'll do anything. You can have my flesh. Take my flesh. She would do anything now to escape her fate. The shadow raised his head as he looked down the trail to the left, away from the dead woman. His hood shifted slightly on his head. Marie stared into the naked face of the shadow, no longer hidden in darkness. Identity revealed. She was unable to look away. Why or what or who were words that had no place anymore for Marie. Slowly, she felt her wrist being pulled by the inexorable strength of the shadow, and before she realized it, she was on her feet, being pulled down the path away from the hanging woman. The shadow released his grip on her wrist, and her hand fell down to her side. Despair was gone now, replaced with the knowledge that she was completely alone for the first time in her life. She looked up to the tall shadow walking beside her, and she put her hand inside the shadows. The shadow's hand remained as it was, neither returning nor rejecting her touch. Come along now, Marie, she heard the shadow say, and she nodded, knowing where she was going. Even so, she continued to count her steps, wondering if everyone saw the same thing in the end. And we are back with Francis again. Francis, that was good. Okay. It gives you the chills. It gives you that feeling of, you know, uh, the fear, the, the, like I said, that heart pounding nature. So, um, mm -hmm. so that's when it comes down to trying to find you and all the things that you've got going on right now, all the projects, they can contact you at francissparks.com. And yep. they also, um, you have an event coming up, correct? Yeah, um, this is an event I was part of last year. Um, it's called Imagine Other Worlds with Authors. It's, uh, it's an acronym that, you know, it's Iowa as an acronym. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's, it's in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's July 21st um, all day. I forget what time it's at. Uh, eight or nine in the morning it starts and it runs into the afternoon. And it's a great event where you can see all sorts of local authors um, writing in every genre. Um, and, yeah, it's, it was a really fun event last year. I'm looking forward to it this year. All right. And will there be like book signings and things like that? Yeah. So um, it's set up in sort of uh, author tables um, mm -hmm. in this big sort of like, it's almost like a maze. So you're walking up and down and, you know, sort of tightly uh, in with all these authors. And yeah, if, if you want your your book signed or, or, or whatever, just to talk to an author. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great time to interact with uh, with them at this event. 
All right. Well, I'd like to encourage our listeners out there who may be in the Iowa area to go check that out and, um, you know, meet Francis and the other authors who are out there because it's it's important to to get an idea and a feel for, for how they – put together these stories and this is this show here is just a tiny little smidge of what um these authors do on a daily basis to build up their characters to to get their plots the way that they want them to bounce ideas off of each other and um actually uh francis when it comes to some of those groups would you mind um sending me uh maybe one or two of those groups that you're involved in and i can put those in the description box so maybe some of our listeners who are uh, aspiring authors might want to join and get involved in their own little groups. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And um, is there any other advice you'd like to give to any aspiring authors out there? Yeah. Um, advice. That's always tricky. Um, so I would say as a word, uh, as a word of warning, beware of anybody that says, you know, that this is the only way you can do something when it comes to writing. I think that's, um, that's just not true. There's so many different ways you can go about this, whether you're an outliner, a plotter, or, you know, more of a pantser, you know, sort of writer. Um, but um, I think one thing that uh, that really, really helped me, like I said before, was just getting other people involved with your, with your, um, with your work at some point, whether like mm-hmm. beta readers or another writing group, um, just to sort of make sure that you're, you've thought about this, thing you've been working on um from every possible way and it made it the best best that it can be um before you put it out there well once again thanks for being here on the show and uh i'd like to thank all of our listeners for listening and if you want to you can go ahead and click subscribe and like any of the videos that we have here on the emmett blackwell show keep on reading keep on writing my friends see you later Are you troubled by strange noises? In that a six foot black silhouette of a cowboy with a cowboy hat, he had a death drop. He says he said there's lights in the sky. Yeah, there's a four lot. There's there's moving real slow. Real slow. It's showtime. <laughs> The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, horror, fantasy, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality.